वेलकम फ्रेंड्स टू सी एन एस सीरीज ऑफ इंटरव्यूज़ फ्राम द थर्ड एशिया पेसिफिक फेमिनिस्ट फोरम और ए पी एफ एफ टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन बींग हेल्ड इन चंग माई थाईलैंड ए पी एफ एफ टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन इज़ ऑर्गेनाइज बाई द एशिया पेसिफिक फोरम ऑन वेमेन लॉ एंड डेवलपमेंट और ए पी डब्ल्यू एल डी एज इट इज़ मोर कॉमनली नोन एज इन दिस एपिसोड वी आर इन कॉन्वर्सेशन विद सारा जमान अ फेमिनिस्ट एंड ह्यूमन राइट्स एक्टिविस्ट फ्राम पाकिस्तान Sara has been a board member of WAR a very apt acronym for war against rape and currently she is director program bodily rights at Shirkat Gah Women's Resource Center Sara was also today a speaker at the first plenary of APFF 2017 uh, Sara my first question to you is that is the current political climate a betting violence against women in your country in south asia and in the entire region. in terms of the situation for women in whether it's in pakistan or whether it's in south asia or generally the asia pacific region it's it's a mixed bag i find that there have been some progress uh, on some levels like for instance there's been a lot of progressive legislation there's more women in politics uh women are asserting their rights but at the same time i find that the religious right in particular and the orthodoxy is on an adescent adescency in the sense that it's increasing and we find that in pakistan in the form of say the council of council of islamic ideology they are supposed to be a recommendatory body but they do tend to have their influence in policy making and in law so we've had a lot of resistance from them in terms of progressive laws for women particularly in the area of domestic violence and in the area of sexual assault and rape um so i find that even though there is progression on some level there's also um, a, a counter uh, that is coming from the right the extreme right and they do hold sway over public policy they do hold sway over the implementation of laws i don't believe that uh, legislation is guarantees protection for women's rights because i've seen in even in the best of situations with the best of laws if they are not implemented then there's no point really women are not being able to take the benefit of law and legislative protection that they may have so i find that orthodoxy is on the rise i find that conservatism is on the rise i find that fundamentalism is on the rise in this region in particular and it is almost rolling back some of the gains that we have made the women's movement has made since say beijing 1995 which i believe was an important landmark for women's rights and a lot of things that were articulated in the beijing platform have been distilled out of the recent sustainable development goals in the agenda 2030 it dilutes a lot of the issues that women had raised in 1995 so i find that although there is progression there is also regression on certain things and rather than activists concentrating on the advancement of rights we are hard pressed to fight just to preserve the rights and the acknowledgement that we have won since 1995 sara can you share some specific examples where religious fundamentalism is affecting gender justice could you elaborate yeah. a little well, more well in terms of the religious right uh and then again you have to before we talk about the religious right you have to understand that it's a wide spectrum of actors it's not most of them are using um or rather um criticizing women's rights to advance their political agendas so we must recognize when we talk about the religious right whether it's fundamentalists or extremists or conservatives uh whichever you know between the black and the white whichever scale they lie on in between um they are doing uh they're saying a lot of things which are not you would often find that it has no basis in religion it is infused with narratives around ethnicity it is infused with narratives around communalism with nationalism 
and all sorts of things like for instance um, if if I were to talk about say Sri Lanka in Sri Lanka you would find Senalese Buddhist women in particular being pushed to produce more babies they are being produced to push more babies and give birth to more babies so that their population outnumbers eventually the number of the Muslim population in that country right you find that that is happening in 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 Sri Lanka then there's a lot of fight back from different countries like for, for instance in Morocco they're trying to get recognition for uh, incestuous rape and the right of a woman to abort in such cases right so again there is a fight back from the religious right saying that there is a marital exemption for rape right so if it happens within a marriage or if it is incestuous you still have to protect the family in the Philippines you find the same thing the Catholic Church is influencing women's access to contraception their access to abortion safe abortion and a lot of other things and and it's it's pretty much uh, like for instance in Egypt another example they are undertaking virginity tests for both girls and boys before marriage to establish that they are fit for marriage so this is a North, Af a North African example. So if you look at the entire Asia Pacific and the MENA region, Middle East and uh, North Africa, there are lots of many, many countries, most countries are struggling for recognition uh, of basic rights, whether it's fundamentally it comes down to women's rights over their bodies. Right? whether it's contraception, whether it's abortion, whether it's the right to refuse child marriage, all of those things. And you would find that there's a lot of concentration of child marriage also here, again, in the Asia Pacific region, particularly in South Asia. And you find that the religious right or, you know, the so-called uh, religious fundamentalists, they are resisting changes, not just to law, but also resisting implementation of law by putting out narratives that are very anti-women and anti-girls and against it goes against every human rights framework that exists that most of these countries have acceded to they are bound to implement or nationalize um, the sayings or whatever they have acceded to in international commitments into their domestic law but they're not doing it so i find personally that states governments in this region as a whole if i were to generalize a we have corrupt governments that have been set up b they are ratifying and acceding to international commitments which they are failing to hold up in the domestic sphere and they they say one thing on the international on international forums and they do quite the contrary on the ground and people don't know they don't know that you have made such and such commitments internationally to save face or to do whatever but you there are very few people that are holding governments to their word in these countries so although there there may be legislation again the implementation is foiled by conservative narratives that are coming in from everywhere that this is our custom this is our tradition this is how our culture is although if really you were to go back into history you wouldn't find anything in history that supports the kind of things that they are saying right so that is what is happening in the asia pacific region fundamentalism religious fundamentalism is on the rise but it is convoluted and very often you cannot find or you cannot trace exactly where the religious text pertaining to that issue is although it's a call to fundamentals but the fundamentals aren't necessarily there to back up <coughs> excuse me to back up their arguments so in most cases it's an infusion of other identities whether it's nationalistic whether it's communal whether it's ethnic that is what is happening in this region which makes it all the more dangerous because you're not being able to separate the 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 direct influence of religion and the in other influences that you will find in these socio-economic settings <clears throat> okay sir even in this dismal scenario firstly what is the way forward what needs to um, be done more when we talk about what needs to be done more 
there is this um, running joke between me and my friends, uh, my colleagues and my comrades um, that are working on human rights. I tend to say that just how we are getting together in the Asia, Femi uh, Asia Pacific Feminist Forum or in other forums and coming together to try and understand what our collective issues are and try and come up with collective solutions. Just like that, our governments are also meeting, you know, here and there. And they are pursuing their own agendas, right? So I think the need of the hour is not to get bogged down with what is happening at the very local and at the very national level. Mm -hmm. If you look beyond the local and the national, as I also said earlier uh, in my talk this morning, that it gives you perspective and it really helps you understand that we are being defeated by the same system of oppression which manifests in different ways in our own countries. The players may be different, the narratives are quite the same and I think the need of the hour is really A, to grow our numbers. B, how do you grow your numbers related to the first point is that you have to activate communities. You have to work at the very local level. If there is no demand from the local level, then all that we do remains superficial. And we are essentially disconnected from the people who are affected the most by these, uh, by these issues that we've been talking about. So I think we really need to expand the discourse, take it down to the grassroots, absolutely, have discussions, detailed discussions, and I always find it to, great, to my great surprise that when you really go down to the community level, to the village level, people are navigating their cultural, social, economic settings in a way that we don't find imaginable sitting on our fancy desks and you know trying to organize. Um, people have their own solutions. They need spaces. They need, and it doesn't have to be a physical space. We have to be creative in how to create those spaces and start the dialogue, start counter discourse. Unless there is enough people that are coming up with an alternate discourse to this hegemonic, you know, um, singular singularizing narratives that we have whether it's on the uh, on the uh, on the issue of religion whether it's on the religion uh, issue of economics it doesn't matter what it is unless you take it down there and learn from those people then only will you be able to find solutions because no one solution applies to all there will always be contextual nuances that you have to take into consideration people are navigating systems of oppression. We need to learn from them what works, what doesn't work, expand the discourse and of course we need solidarity. We need because in this day and age our governments are trying to break us up within our countries and across regions and we need to see through that. We need to see that they are benefiting if we are divided. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of pressure on uh, different civil society organizations across the region where the states and the governments are clamping down on NGO activities, on activist activities, forced disappearances, censorship, you name it, all sorts of things. We need to really, of course we need to be brave, mm -hmm. but we need to connect with others. If we don't connect and we isolate ourselves, it's not gonna help us, it's not gonna help the cause, and it's certainly not going to help people who are isolated and marginalized in the first place. So we need to really harness on, on those opportunities where we can come together. And it's not just me who's been doing this for God knows donkey's years. It's been so long and others who've been doing it for much longer. We need to include more people. We need to expand the discourse bring in young people, bring in all sorts of people, even bring in the right. Because I know that it's a losing battle, but unless you know what they're thinking, you can't counter it. It has to be based on what they're thinking and what their line of action is. 
unfortunately in this region civil society may be it may be organizing better maybe doing all of those things better but we still don't have the numbers and we need to reflect why that is you have done a lot of work on women's rights particularly sexual violence against women would you like to share some of your success stories somewhere there yeah. <laughs> well there are few yeah because they will give us that sort of energy to move on you know successes are so few and far in between that makes them sweeter um i've worked with war against rape for many years around 7 years or so and during that time <clears throat> me and my colleagues um we were trying to help in individual cases assist in any way that we could and war against rape was a service based organization but doing that year after year case after case started to realize that we're not going to do we're not going to achieve any change for women on a sustainable basis unless we start to address and really highlight the structural problems that are there so during my time the few last years that i served at war we undertook some research we tried to bring in about 20 odd years of experience of dealing with cases and working with families and not just the survivor but also you know the entire unit uh the family we documented cases we not just tracked what happened from the moment that the survivor broke her silence or his silence we tracked what happened <clears throat> when they approached the criminal justice system starting with maybe it could be the union council at in your area or it could be the police station wherever they started so they we tracked that journey from the first breaking of silence to as they went through the criminal justice system right up till the judgment and then even after what happens to women and girls who've been subjected to this and in case after case there were so many similarities that we knew we started to understand that some of the problems were emanating from the law some of it was emanating from the structures of law and some of it was just the culture of law not in in terms of how it's implemented so we tracked all of those things we put them out in in a couple of documents and one of the maybe one i mean if if you were to consider legislation progressive legislation as a sign of success or at least the first step some of the publications that we churned out during my time in war many of those um recommendations in terms of the law and procedure were taken up by legislators and we had in 2006 um rape laws were modified in pakistan so i was really really happy to note that some of the concrete suggestions that i had given in those documents like for instance doing away with the requirement of prompt complaint right because often it's in cases like these uh, reporting is delayed doing away with um defense having the liberty to impeach the character of the survivor and calling in her past sexual history to discredit her claim that was also amended so and uh, alongside a lot of other things like a 6 month time gap on legislate on on educating in cases of rape and sexual assault so for me personally for all the research and all the interactions that i had with families with survivors and all of that that i was able to document through these researches was taken into consideration when rape laws were first amended in 2006 not at at that time they didn't take so many things into consideration but in 2016 substantial amount of our recommendations were taken into consideration so the law has changed in pakistan and it makes me happy to know that at least there is that room that you know survivors didn't have that room before but unfortunately at the same time i i recognize that 
because our criminal justice system is so warped um, in terms of really delivering justice. It's a court of law, not a court of justice. I know that despite the legal wins, it may be difficult to actually have lawyers use the changes in law to their benefit to be able to argue and counter argue to win cases in favor of survivors and whatever story it is that they have to tell so there would be more room but it still remains to be seen so that's one of the major wins i would say other than that force on a smaller level war towards the end won a lot of cases we had judges calling us over the phone saying we've had a case um, it's been reported the police has brought us brought it in can you come over we had the police surgeon's office uh, in karachi calling us over the phone saying you know such and such person has come here uh, would you like to assist so there is that strong you know recognition that the organization was doing good work and it could assist, and it did assist, and it did win a lot of cases. But again, being the activist and being an idealist that we are, we know that you don't have recorrectional facilities in Pakistan. So conviction for me, it's not justice, really. It's a step, it's a step. No, but as you said, having a good law in place, that is the first main step. Right. Yes, implement, but because implementation process will start that's the second step. Right. So at least you have something to back up on. Something has to be implemented. So right. I think that, that that's a big success. And, and of course, we have to carry it to its fruition. That yes. is important. Yes. But having a good law is the first step, I think, and, and a very important step. Without yeah. that, you just can't even argue to have it. Uh, my last question, Sarah, what does APFF 2017 mean to you and to the people you work with? I'm extremely excited to be at the APFF uh, for the reason that it provides an opportunity to meet with wonderful people that are working in very difficult contexts, that are struggling both within themselves and with systems of oppression that are outside of themselves. To me, it's a great opportunity to learn. To me, it's a great opportunity to share and to me, I, as an activist, I know that we will not be able to achieve half of our ambitions for this world, which is for a better world, unless we come together, unless we connect with each other. So for me, the Asia Pacific Feminist Forum is important for these reasons. And of course, for my personal understanding, when I hear from colleagues, the the problems that they then the challenges that they are facing in their own context it can't you can't help but wonder oh well, so we have it better that way oh no we have it worse you know compared to your context and then you start to understand why the differences are there and what what where is their divergence and then where to um, you know the cro common problems lie so you get a sense of trends and you, you, that puts you in a better position to predict also. Predict in the sense that if governments and states are inclined towards this particular direction, which is oppressive, which is ignoring the rights of citizens, and they are small wins or small pockets of resistance, it not only inspires you, gives you courage, also gives you ideas. So for me, it's, it's very important to come together with people who are extremely brave, courageous, and facing all sorts of problems that we may not be facing just yet. We may be facing a different form of it, but it, it, gets, it sets your imagination on fire. And for me, that is why this forum is extremely important. And that is what I hope to take back when I go back to Pakistan having a broader context, having more information and knowledge. What can we do at the local level, given the challenges and opportunities that we have going for us? Thank you, Sara. And as the saying goes, that uh, share your sorrows or share your failures and they divide, and share your joys or successes and they multiply. So, so I think that is also what the forum is about. Friends, you were listening to Sara Zaman, Director Program, Bodily Rights, 
at Shirkat Gah Women's Resource Center in Pakistan, who is waging a battle against gender justice in Pakistan. She was in conversation with Citizen News Service at the third Asia Pacific Feminist Forum or APFF 2017, which is being held in Chiang Mai, Thailand. APFF 2017 is organized by the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development or APWLD. For more details, be welcome to check out APWLD's website www.apwld.org or visit CNS at www.citizen-news.org. Thanks for listening and stay tuned.